All right, the next one we will discuss over here, the next lecture, is an advocate for our time. And it's a provocative picture that we have over here with the tables of stone and the finger of God in the background. Well, Exodus chapter 31 verse 18 says, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. So God wrote in stone the Ten Commandments. He wrote them with his own finger. Exodus 32 verse 16 says, And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. Now in fact, there are only three times in the Bible when God wrote, and all three times he wrote with his finger. That's this one, Exodus chapter 32 verse 16, God wrote the Ten Commandments in stone with his finger. Jesus wrote in the sand with his finger. And when Babylon was about to fall, the hand wrote with the finger against the wall. So that's fascinating. God wrote himself three times and every time it was with his finger. And when Moses had smashed these tables because the children of God had apostatized while he was on the mount, Deuteronomy 10 verse 2 says, And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables, God says, Make another set of tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. So the tables of the testimony containing the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God were placed inside the ark. Right, now let us first define the question of sin. It's very important that we know where we stand on these issues because there are many teachings in the world out there and we want to stay Bible based. 1 John 3 verse 4 Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law for sin is the transgression of the law. Is that pretty plain? So if you transgress God's law then you are committing sin. So if I steal, do I transgress God's law? Yes. yes. If I do anything contrary to God's law, by definition of the New Testament, then I am sinning. That's the New Testament. People like to say, you know, the law was for the Old Testament. But the definition is in the New Testament as to what constitutes sin. We look at a dictionary, as to what transgression is, it's a stepping over to transgress, the act of transgressing, the breaking or violation of any law. So if you're going to transgress, there must be a law. Romans chapter 4 verse 15 says, where no law is, there is no transgression. That's fascinating. So Adam and Eve, did they have a law? Yes. They must have had a law, otherwise they couldn't have transgressed. Now, can God's law change, you think? It's written in stone, does that say something? It's written in stone. Now man can change laws, but God's law doesn't change. You know, in South Africa, where I come from, they had some strange laws in our country, some weird laws, and they've been changed. In the past, there was a law, which was called the Immorality Act, and if a white man was in the company of a black lady or vice versa, then uh, that was problematic. You could go to jail. Today that law is rescinded, it is no more, and it's no problem. So you see, you can either remove the law to remove the problem, or if the law stands, well then, if you break it, you're a transgressor, right or wrong. Okay, so if, the, if there's no law, there can be no transgression. And Romans 6 verse 23 says the wages of sin, which we've just defined by the Bible, is transgression of the law, so we could read it, the wages of transgressing of God's law is death. So this is an important issue. Some people say there is no law, we cannot keep the law. But the Bible clearly teaches 
that if we transgress God's law, well, the wages of sin or death. Now, sin separates from God. Let's read that. Isaiah 59 verse 2. Your iniquities, that's your sins, have separated you from your God. That's important. Some like to turn this definition upside down. I prefer to keep the definition as the Bible says it. Sin is the transgression of the law, and if you sin, that causes separation. So we've been separated from God because of sin. But there is a means of resolving the problem, and that means is Christ. Romans 6 verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now, two possibilities. Adam and Eve sinned. And the wages of sin is death. Two possibilities. Either we do away with the law, like in South Africa, there was a law, it was a stupid law, so they did away with the law. There is no more law. And so, if there is no more law, then there is no more transgression. Does that make sense? Yes. So if you take away the law, that solves the problem. Then you're free. And everybody who was in jail because of the Immorality Act was set free. Off you go. There is no more law. So you're no longer in transgression. You're free. Did Christ do that? Did he set aside the law, yes or no? No. You see, the law said, you will die. So Christ could have said, ooh, I made a law, but that law is too tough for you fellows, so let's just take the law away. But God doesn't change. So now we have an impasse. The law says you will surely die. But Christ did not deal with the issue lightly. Had, he been, had it been possible for him to take away the law, would it then be necessary to pay the penalty of the law, yes or no? No. So in other words, the fact that Christ came and died means he paid the penalty, right or wrong? Does the law then still stand, yes or no? Absolutely. So some people like to say, the cross does away with the law. I would like to tell you, the cross is the guarantee that the law stands. Amen. The cross is the guarantee that the, Lord, that the law stands. Because, had it been possible to take the law away, then Christ need not have died. Does that make sense? Okay. I will put enmity, remember that text, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15, there would be enmity between the devil and Christ. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God's, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now is that confusing, or is it not? No, it's not confusing. Can I be saved by keeping the law? No, I am saved by grace. Christ paid the penalty for me, and He died for me, and by grace I am saved. If I accept the gift of salvation, I am saved by grace. The law cannot save me, the law is just writing. The law is not a means to save me, the law is just a means of telling me what is right and wrong. Does that make sense? Alright. For sin shall not have dominion over ye, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? What does Paul say there? God forbid. In other words, what he's saying here is, grace saves me. And works cannot save me, but sin must not rule over me. Transgression of the law must not be part of my life. So because grace saves me, what then? Shall I now be able to sin, yes or no? God forbid. God forbid. Grace establishes the law. 
I look to the cross and I say, Wow, Lord, why did you have to suffer for me and die? And the Lord says, Because you are a transgressor and the law requires that you die. Therefore, I pray the price for you and the justice has been done. Justice has been done. Let me give you an example. If you have a little daughter, if you have a little daughter, some guy comes along, rapes her, beats her up, mutilates her, strangles her, and leaves her lying there dead. Wow. And you're crushed, absolutely devastated. And you go to court, and the judge says, now that was not a nice thing to do, please see to it that you don't do it again, off you go. How would you feel? Cheated. <laughs> you would be pretty mad, right? Because there was no what? Justice. No justice. No justice whatsoever. And God is 100% just. But God is also 100% gracious. Tough to be both. So God took upon Himself the penalty. And He paid the price and he died. Does he require your death also? Now there's a trick question for you. Yes. yes. He requires your death. What kind of death does he require? He requires the death of the old man of sin. In other words, the old you must die and a new new must rise from the dead in Christ through his power and his resurrection. And the new man is transformed. He's a transformed man. And in Christ we walk this road again. We walk this road again and Christ gives us the strength to do what is right. Wow! We have a second chance. We have a second chance. Now if this murderer is sentenced to death and he completely repents and there he sits and somebody is willing to exchange places for, with him and he has a second chance, what would he do? Run out and murder or would he perhaps consider, wow, I have a chance, I better walk straight. Walk straight. So God forbid that grace should do away with keeping the law. Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. We're not saved because of any good thing that we do. For by the law is the what? The knowledge of sin, Romans 3, 19 and 20. So the law cannot save me, only Jesus can save me. But the law can tell me what's right and wrong. So if I know what is right and I do it not, what was that text we read? Then it be for me what? Sin. sin. Okay. So the law tells me what sin is. Romans 3 verse 31. Do we make void the law through faith? What does he say? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. You know, it's amazing how Paul is distorted on this particular point. Because people believe that we are under grace and keeping the law, that was a Jewish thing. No, 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 no. The Bible teaches that we are under grace and that works cannot save us. We can do what is right as much as we like if we don't accept the free gift of salvation in Christ. It's meaningless. Because only in a person there is salvation in Jesus Christ. But the law teaches me what is right and wrong, and when I come into harmony with Christ, I will keep His commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Romans 3 verse 31. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Romans 7 verse 12. So the Bible clearly teaches that the cross does not take away the law, it establishes the law. It establishes the authority of the law. Because had it been possible to take it away, Christ need not have died. 
Therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 1. Does the Spirit like sin? Nope. The Spirit does not like sin. So if you are in Christ, you say, Lord, I long to do your will. Show me what is right and what is wrong. And walk therein. Walk therein. Sin broke the relationship. For Adam and his wife, the Lord God, made coats of skins and he clothed them. Genesis 3 verse 21. Here they had lost their robe of right righteousness. And God in his mercy says, I will cover you again. And he gives them the promise of the Messiah and he covers them with his righteousness. So the first symbol of death was an animal that died. Right or wrong? Yes? An animal died and it became a type of Christ who would die for us. Now let's have a look at another law which was called the ceremonial law and it pertained to all the festivals and rules and regulations that Israel had to keep. Now remember, the Ten Commandments were written how? We read it by the finger of God. It was written on stone and where were they to be placed? In the ark. In the, ark. the ceremonial law was written by Moses and placed beside the ark. Let's read that carefully. Deuteronomy chapter 31, And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law. Who's writing now? Moses. Moses. In a book, not on tablets of stone. Until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this, what? Book of the law, and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a witness against thee. Now remember that carefully. Engrave it. It's good to engrave God's word. What must be there? The book of the law and it serves as a what against us? A testimony against us. A witness against us. So this law tells us something about ourselves, right or wrong. It tells us, you are sinners. The law, the Ten Commandments, tells us what sin is. But this law tells us our part in this. And it points us to the solution. It points us to the solution. There are two separate laws. So the one was the tablets of stone was placed in the ark, written by the finger of God. The other was written on a scroll, the book of the law placed beside the ark. Now the moral law in the Bible, the Ten Commandments in James is called the royal law. It's called the law of liberty. Not the law of bondage, the law of liberty. I'll tell you something, if everybody on this planet kept the Ten Commandments, we would be free indeed. Did you know that? Amen. Because you could walk outside and you can get into your car, you don't have to turn the lock, you don't have to even turn the ignition, just put your foot down and go. You wouldn't need a key and you would have to have no fear at night, not look left nor right nor anything. Nobody will come and clobber you over the head. You would be free if everybody kept the law of God, right or wrong? Okay. Exodus 31 says it was written with the finger of God on stone. Deuteronomy says it was placed inside the ark. 1 John 3 verse 4 to 8, Romans 4, existed before sin. Didn't it say where there is no law, there is no transgression? Yes. And Adam and Eve transgressed, so there must have been a law, right or wrong? Yes. All right. Romans says the purpose is to reveal what sin is. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Deuteronomy 5.22 and Psalm 19.7 and Romans 7 and many, many others. It is complete. It is perfect. It is holy. It is just. It is good. That's what he said about the law of God. And Psalms 111 verse 7 and 2, 8 says, It shall stand forever. Let's look at the ceremonial law. 
It's called the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Ephesians 2.15, Hebrews 9 and 10. It was written by Moses. And it was put in a book of the law, Deuteronomy 31. We just read that. It was placed beside the ark, not in the ark. Deuteronomy 31, 24, 26. And it was given after sin. After sin. Galatians 3, 19. The law was added because of transgression. So transgression requires a law, so another law was added because of transgression. So we have two laws. The one is the ceremonial, the other one is the moral. And the purpose was to reveal the remedy for sin. Leviticus 6, 1, 6 to 7, John 7 and 29, and Matthew 27, 51. It's temporary. It will be done away with. Now, we must know very well what we're dealing with here. We must know these two sides of the story because in the Bible they talk about the law. And you have to figure out from the context, is it the moral law or is it the ceremonial law? Tricky. And you can get very confused if you don't know exactly what this definition is. You have to know it exactly. So that's what it looked like. There was the moral law. It was inside. And uh, above it, was a gold sheet which was called the mercy seat. Oh, wonderful stuff. We'll come to it just now. And then the book of the law written by Moses with all the laws of ceremonies placed inside it. Now, there are four Gospels written in the Bible. It's the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. People say, oh, why is everything being repeated? What's the point? Well, there's lots of points because each one is slightly different. Matthew talks about Christ the King. Mark talks about Christ the Servant. Luke talks about Christ the Man. And John talks about Christ the Divine. So here you have all the aspects of the Godhood. Now let's take a look at the five books of Moses. And let's have a look at those. Genesis is the book of origins, the fall, and the promise of redemption. So Christ is in that. Exodus. Christ our sanctuary. And we'll be dealing with that. Wow, it's beautiful. Leviticus. Christ our sacrifice. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The Lamb stood for who? Stood for Christ. So Leviticus is Christ our sacrifice. Numbers is Christ our guide. And Deuteronomy is Christ our reward. So the first five books of the Bible give you the plan of salvation in a nutshell. Tells us about the law and the ceremonial law tells us about the remedy for sin. And since the remedy lies in a person, all these issues deal with one individual only and that is Jesus Christ. Let's see if we can find that. Genesis chapter 26 verse 5. Fascinating text. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Hello? There are people that say that the commandments belong to the Jews. And they were given at Sinai on the Ten Commandments on the Tablets of Stones. Right or wrong? Well, what laws and statutes and commandments did Abraham keep? That was before the Jews. Obviously, he kept the commandments of God. So, all right, the commandments were there. They were there from the beginning. But because mankind is so forgetful, they were given in stone again to posterity. And Jesus said, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus sets the example. He kept the commandments. Jesus says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law. He's referring there to the whole Pentateuch, which is what the first five books of the Moses, but they contain the law of ten commandments. So not one jot or one tittle will be removed that includes the ten commandments. All the prophets, everything that has been said by the prophets, I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from, pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. 
So you see, Jesus didn't come to change anything. He came to fulfill it. He's the fulfillment of the ceremonial law. He is the solution to sin. And He came because the law of Ten Commandments had condemned all of us to death and He came to do justice to pay the price. So at the cross, justice and mercy kissed each other. Wow! He says, it is easier, this is Jesus speaking, for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of the pen to drop out of the law. Luke 16 and 7. The 16 verse 17. You see that the law stands? Yes or no? Okay, so it stands. 1 John 5 verse 3. This is love for God, to obey His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. Some people say, I cannot keep God's law. It's impossible. It's impossible. I've had preachers tell me that. Preachers tell me it's impossible to keep God's commandments. We don't have to keep God's commandments. In fact, the commandments have been done away with. I said, preacher, give me your wife. I need her tonight. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's no commandment which says thou shalt not commit adultery. No, I didn't mean it like that. And I said, well, how do you mean it then? How do you mean it then? Is it all right if I knock your daughter's block off? Is that okay? No, I didn't mean it. I said, so, so, so you shouldn't kill? We can run through them, you know. They all want them, but they don't want them. Isn't that strange? <laughs> Either they're there or they're not there. The Lord says His commandments are not burdensome. And being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that what? Obey, Obey Him. Hebrews 5 verse 9, obedience. If you have a gospel without obedience, you have a half a gospel. It's standing on one leg. It's going to become unstable and it's going to fall. Now let's have a look at this. This should knock your socks off. The law in the New Testament. Matthew 4.10 or Revelation 19.10 Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and Him only shalt thou serve. Check it out for yourselves. It's there. It's New Testament. I'm not quoting Old Testament here. 1 John 5 21, Acts 17, 29. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. That's the second commandment. 1 Timothy 6, 1. That the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. If you look at Mark 2, 27, 28. Hebrews 4, 4. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Here, yeah, honor your father and your mother. Matthew 19, 19, Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. Thou shalt not kill. Romans 13, 9, James 2, 11. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Matthew 19, 18. Thou shalt not steal. Romans 13, 9, Ephesians 4, 20. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Romans 13, 9. Thou shalt not covet. Romans 7, 7. Is the law there, yes or no? Yes. In the New Testament, yes or no? Yes. yes. Does it stand? Yes. Absolutely. Don't touch the law of God. It was necessary for God to die because that law stands. Galatians 3.19 Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Who was the seed? We discussed that just now. Jesus. And there was a law that was added because of transgression. Now think, ladies and gentlemen, think. Transgression requires that there be a law, right? So let's read this a little bit differently. Let's say, there was a law added because of another law that was transgressed. Is that what it says? All right. Which law was transgressed? The Ten Commandments. Which law was added because of the transgression? Ceremonial. The ceremonial law. Aha! Aha! So the solution to the problem was added because of the problem that was created by the transgression of the law. Simple as that. So here we had it from the beginning. This one over here, his name was Cain. He said, I will not obey. I will bring the works of my own hands. There are so many people that say that. You know that? Unbelievable. And Abel said, the Lord says, bring a lamb, because the lamb stands for the Messiah who will come, who will die in my stead, and shed his blood, 
and I trust in the merits of the blood of the Lamb. He was saved by grace or by works? Grace. So grace did exist in the Old Testament, yes or no? Yes. So how were you saved in the Old Testament? By keeping the law or by grace? Okay, so has anything changed? No. Nope. I am the Lord, I change not, says the Lord. I am the Lord, I change not. Let's look at the ceremony that had to be enacted. Here is the sanctuary that had to be built. According to precise specifications, there was a white wall of white linen all around it. There was one opening which was called the gate. When you came in, there was an altar of burnt offering. If you went further, there was a laver. If you went into the first chamber, the first tabernacle, there was a candlestick. On the other side, there was a table of showbread. In the middle, there was an altar of incense. And if you went into the second chamber behind that, there were the Ten Commandments in the ark with the covering cherubs. That's what it was. Let's have a look at this. Exodus, tw Exodus 25, 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. It was a symbol of Christ dwelling amongst his people. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, says he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee on the mount, Hebrews 8 verse 5. Everything according to the pattern. Not one jot, not one tittle, don't move anything. It must be exact. God is very exact. So he told him exactly how to build it. Every single detail. And every single detail is important and nobody bothers to read it. Oh, that was Old Testament. But the Old Testament and what happened was written for our admonition, says Paul. So we better make Sure, when we look at it, well, all these pillars, the Lord says this is a copy of a tabernacle, a temple in heaven, and he says, those that overcome, I will make a pillar in my house. So the pillar stands for the redeemed. Interesting that there was money to be paid for the construction and everyone had to pay a redemption price and it was the same for poor and for rich it was if i remember correctly a quarter of a shekel of silver and everyone had to pay it and jesus sent his disciple to fetch the redemption money out of the fish of the mouth do you remember that and there was enough to pay for two of them Jesus is even willing to pay the redemption money for you. But that was the symbol, the socket. Everybody has to partake, has to pay, has to give up something. And here was an outer gate, one gate. And this gate had a covering over here which had four colors in it. There was purple in it. There was red in it. There was blue in it, and there was white in it, and then there was fine gold thread. Purple is the color of royalty. Red is the color of sacrifice. Blue is the color of obedience, and white is the color of righteousness. Those are the aspects of Christ. And by the way, if you want to have purple, you have to mix red and blue. So sacrifice and obedience makes for royalty. Wow, it is beautiful. Jesus says, I am the door. And nobody comes to the Father except by me. And if you don't enter through this door, he says, you have no part of him. So Jesus is the door. This gate, there was only one. And then there is another one over there. This one was called the gate. That one was called the door. And it had the same material. And then there was another one on the inside which had the same material, the same colors. So Christ is identified with the gate and with the door and the veil between the first and the second chambers. And when you came in over here, the first thing you were confronted with was the altar of burnt offering. What happened there? 
a sacrifice. And who does that sacrifice represent? Represents Christ. So the white linen around it is the, is the righteousness of Christ. When you enter in through the gate, in other words, you accept salvation in Jesus Christ, you enter in through the gate, and you are surrounded by the righteousness of Christ. Beautiful. It's called justification. And you stand before the altar of burnt offering, and there is a lamb, and you witness the sacrifice of the Son of God in type, to take away your sins. Hebrews 9 verse 24 says, For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So the earthly sanctuary served just as a copy of a heavenly sanctuary, where Christ is our high priest. Hebrews 9 verse 8 says, The way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Christ's ministry in the heavenly could only begin once the earthly was completed. How do we know that? Because in the earthly tabernacle, the priest was not allowed to enter the first chamber until the sacrifice had been made. There was a lamb, and then there was a ram of consecration. The lamb represents Christ at the beginning of his ministry. The ram represents Christ at the end of his ministry. And if that ram of consecration was sacrificed, the priest was permitted to go into the holy place. And the Bible tells us that Christ entered not with the, fr with the blood of sheep and goats, but with his own precious blood. So this served as a guarantee of the coming Messiah. Beautiful symbolism, who serve as an example and a shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. It's a copy of the heavenly. He Hebrews 8 verse 5. So the tabernacle pitched in the midst of the people represented the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now don't you think it's important that we understand the ministry of Christ, yes or no? Yes. I think so. Jesus in the midst of his people, John 1 verse 14. So let's study the ministry. Because if we study it, then we will be able to discern many a deception in the world out there. Many people end their gospel once they've come through the gate. Oops, there they are. They're inside. I'm covered by the righteousness of Christ. Life goes on as before. Nothing has changed. No, no, no. There's more to the ministry. You first face that first tabernacle. Let's look at the furniture once again. You come in. Then there was the altar of burnt offering. Then there was the laver. And then you went into the first chamber over there. And in the first chamber on the one side there was the candlestick, then there was the altar of incense over there, then there was the table of showbread, and there was the candlestick, the seven candlestick. And on the inside there was this Ark of the Covenant. So the court, the outer court, represents the earth, the gate, the door, the veil, represent the three dimensions of Christ's ministry. Three dimensions, not just one. There are four pillars for the veil, four coverings, four colors, four ingredients in the showbread. Four is the number of the earth, north, east, south, west. The whole earth is covered by this redemption. 48 boards, 60 pillars, multitudes of 144,000. The sockets were made of silver, as I said, made from the redemption money. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3.11 He is the foundation of every single pillar. Five bars holding the structure together. Five factors holding the body in unity of the spirit. Remember? There is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Five factors holding the sanctuary together. Now let's get to the sacrifice. The lamb was brought and the sinner was faced with the lamb. What did he have to do? He had to place his hands on top of the lamb. And then the lamb was killed 
and the fat was removed and burnt. Fat is a symbol of sin, the burning of fat is the purging of sin, Leviticus 3.3, 3, Psalms 37.20. So that fat which sits around the inner parts, surrounding the very internal organs, becomes a symbol of sin which is burnt up in Christ. Beautiful symbolism. The lamb was attached to the horns of the altar. The lamb Christ is bound to the sacrifice. He becomes your sacrifice. So the lamb attached by a cord to the horns of the altar and you had to sacrifice the lamb. You had to see that your part in it was. You put the lamb to death. The high priest catches the blood. The high priest catches the blood. And in a sense, the blood of the lamb purges you of your sin. And the high priest himself is a symbol of Christ. Of course, in this system, the lamb and the high priest are really one, but of course the lamb is dead after the process, so the high priest represents Christ, who is, in a sense, the risen Savior. Leviticus 4, 27, 31, And if anyone sin through ignorance while he doeth something against any of the commandments of the Lord, then he shall bring his offering, and he shall lay his hands upon the head of the sin offering, and slay the sin offering. We are responsible for the death of Christ. And the priest shall make atonement of him. Christ makes atonement for us, the priest becomes a type. And it shall be forgiven him. There's the plan, how to get rid of sin. So you laid your hands on top of the slam. Let's read what the Jewish Encyclopedia says about this. It says, The laying of hands upon the victim's head is an ordinary rite by which the substitution and transfer of sins are affected. In every sacrifice, there is the idea of substitution. The victim takes the place of the human sinner. I have a question for you. Was the gospel preached to them, yes or no? Yes. It was not preached to them like it's preached to us, but it was preached to them in type. If they had studied the ceremony, they would have seen the ministry of Christ. But they started using the ceremony as a ritual. And when you ritualize something, you lose the essence. So the high priest, the lamb, the blood, everything points to Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. John 1 verse 29. Behold him. Look at him. There's the typology. It's fascinating that Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac and he was to do it on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is the very mount where the temple is built, was built and the temple stood for the sanctuary, the ministry of Christ. When they quarried Mount Moriah, Solomon had the quarry made in Mount Moriah and they dug out the blocks of stone. And that created a valley between two hills. And the one hill was called Golgotha. Fascinating that Mount Moriah was one hill and that Jesus Christ died on Mount Moriah. Wow! He died on the same mount, symbolizing the death of the Lamb. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. So is Christ dead now that he died? Or is he resurrected and is an advocate for us? So is Christ's work finished at the cross or is he doing still something? He's still doing something. Oh yes, the price for sin has been paid in the full. But the work of Christ is not finished. Otherwise, it should have come to an end then. Christ is the advocate. We can still find salvation in Him. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him and with His, his stripes we are healed. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So must we confess, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you know that there are preachers who say that there is nothing more wicked than we can do than to talk about the sinful nature of man? 
I have news for you. If we don't talk about sin, then we don't need a solution. You might as well go without Christ, right or wrong? Okay. So all of these symbols stood for the high priest. Now here's the labor. The labor came after the sacrifice. Many religious systems come in, they want to accept the righteousness of Christ, they come into the door, they accept the vicarious sacrifice of the cross, and then they say, thanks a lot, now I'm saved. But there's a washing to be done, yes or no? A cleansing of rebirth, a change must take place in the character, something must happen. So the laver represents the washing by water. There it was, and you washed at the laver. The priest did it as a symbol. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and then there was the first chamber, and the table and the sobread, which was called the sanctuary. And the high priest went into that daily, not without blood. Now this is what happened. Imagine this. The sinner brings the lamb, the lamb is slaughtered, and the entrails are burnt, and the carcass is eventually burnt without the city, outside the city. And that symbolizes that Christ would die outside, that he would be killed and eliminated there outside the city. Then the high priest would cook a portion, a tiny ceremonial portion, and the writings tell us that it was about the size of a pea. He would eat it. And in type, that confessed sins to the Lamb were transferred to the High Priest. Now he, in type, carries your sin like Christ bears our sins. Now the High Priest did a sacrifice for himself, plus all the confessed sins that he had taken upon himself, and he took that blood and he brought it into the sanctuary daily. And he put it on the horns of the altar. So in type, our sins have been removed and placed on record in the sanctuary. And he keeps the light burning. The light stands for Jesus Christ, the light of the world. This is a depiction of the uh, Ark of Titus where he took the furnishings away after the destruction of Jerusalem and they carried these things away. Where they are today, one wonders. Jesus says, John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Oil that was in the lamp is a symbol of the Holy Spirit that would disseminate the life so through the Holy Spirit. And the smoke of the incense, the incense that was burnt on the altar of incense, which came from the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. Everything dealt with Jesus. So the priest burnt this incense and this represents our prayers going up to God, being made acceptable through Jesus Christ. And then there was this blood that was transferred, transferring the record of sin to the sanctuary. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is in my flesh, which I shall give for the light of the world. That was the table of showbread. Bread without leaven, no sin. Now, in other words, you came in, you were covered by the righteousness of Christ, you accept the sacrifice of, Christ, sacrifice of Christ, you must be washed by rebirth, and then what must you do? Partake of the light through the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the light of the world. My word, thy word, is a what unto my feet? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And if you do not partake of the body of Christ, if you do not make Christ part of you, you have no part in Him, and you speak to God through Christ. So Christ becomes your personal friend. You eat, sleep, and drink, and walk Him. That's called sanctification. And the Bible says without sanctification you will not see God. It's not enough to say I'm justified, but I don't want any of the rest of it. You've got to take the whole package or nothing. That's what it's all about. So the table of showbread represents Christ for his people. There are 12 showbreads, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. The numbers are significant. The ingredients of 
The incense represents all mankind. Hebrews 9 verse 3, And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. Now there we go into the most holy. Now, we've been talking a lot, and maybe you're smoking a little bit up here already. So shake your heads and go, wake up. You all awake? Great. Because now we're going to do something really exciting. We're going to look at that second tabernacle. They say my hair is all untidy, who cares? Anyway. The first tabernacle represents your daily commitment to Christ. Partaking of the word, partaking of the life, leaving, living a life in Christ. But it also contains the record of all confessed sins. Is that understood by everyone? Because the blood was transferred to the horns of the altar, is that right? So it contains the records of all the sins. Let me tell you some good news. Blessed are you if the record of your sin is transferred and recorded in the sanctuary. Blessed are you. It's not bad news, it's good news. Because those sins that are recorded there are forgiven sins. Did you know that? All the sins that you have confessed over the Lamb and that have been transferred to the high priest and have been recorded in the heavens are your confessed sins. So one day when the record of heaven is to be purged and cleansed from sin they will open the books and they will say here is the record of Walter Fight's sin. And they will read a list so long it will stretch 50,000 times around the globe. Hopefully. And the devil will come and he will be the accuser of the brethren, right or wrong. And he will say, I know that I made that guy do this. And they look up the record and they say, yep, here it is. It says, pardon. Anything else? Oh, but, but, but I know that he did that. Let's check it out. Oh, oh, yep, yeah, here it is. It says pardon. And if he can mention one that's not on the list, you're in trouble. So, get your sins into the sanctuary. Confess and forsake. And you will be safe. The judgment is good news if your sins are recorded in the sanctuary. Now, in heaven, one day, I have good news for you. Christ's redemption is so complete that you will stand before God, not as forgiven sinners, but as individuals that are as though they have never sinned. How far will God remove your sins from you? As far as the east is from the west. That's infinitely far. There's no way they'll ever get back to you. You will stand before God as though you have never sinned. You will have a perfect right to heaven one day if your record of sin is recorded over there. It's the most beautiful doctrine in the world. The most beautiful doctrine in the world. There's nothing to fear if you have confessed your sins and forsaken them. Remember Mary Magdalene? Do you remember her? When she was accused, Jesus said to her, I don't condemn you either. Is that right? That's grace. That's called grace. And then he says, go and sin no more. What's that? Putting her under law. So, law and grace go together. So now, the record of sin is there. And now, once a year, the record of sin was cleansed. And for that purpose, the priest had to go into the most holy. What an ominous situation. He had little bells around him. Pomegranates and bells, pomegranates and bells, pomegranates and bells. And the bells would ring. And they used to tie a string to his leg. Because if he went into the presence of a holy God with sin, he would die instantly. And they would pull him out from under the, the veil, dead. That's how serious it was. So it was a serious situation. The priest 
would make full confession of his sins and make sure his sins were all purged. And then he went into the presence of a holy God. He entered into the Most Holy. Now there was the Ten Commandments, the Tablets of Stone, and the two angels, and the Shekinah glory who would appear above the Ten Commandments, which contain the law of God, condemning the sinner to death if he is a transgressor, was the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was of pure gold. And it represents the mercy of Christ, shielding you from the condemnation of the law. Fascinating story. You know that mercy sheet was one and a half cubits high. And the grate on which the sacrifice was burnt outside on the altar was one and a half cubits high. Little detail like that just boggles the mind. In other words, God's justice is as high as His mercy. <laughs> wow. Anyway, here He would go in and He would sprinkle special blood at the veil and in front of of the ark. It contained, of course, the Ten Commandments. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalms 119, 165. Look at the furniture, furnishings. There was the altar of burnt offerings, the laver, and then on either side the table of showbread and the candlesticks, then the altar of incense, and then the ark. It was in the shape of a cross. The cross and its shadow. Beautiful. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. That represented sanctification through your life. Hebrews 9 verse 6. We have a high priest who passed into the heavens, Jesus son, Christ, the Son of God. Hebrews 4.14. We have that privilege today. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true sub-tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. Hello? Is there a tabernacle which God pitched, yes or no? Yes. Well, either the scriptures are there to admonish us and to give us the truth, or they are not. It says there is one, so I believe there is one, because that's what it says. But Christ being come a high priest by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having ordained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9, 11, 12. Christ is that high priest. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. The earthly sacrifice came to an end. The ceremonial law was done away with. Why? Because it was fulfilled in... Christ, if I now take a lamb and I sacrifice it today for my sins, what am I saying? I've said this before. Jesus. That Jesus' sacrifice was not good enough. Now the Jews want to build a new temple and institute the sacrificial system, yes or no? Yes. I want to tell you that's blasphemy. Yes. And their sins and iniquities will remember no more. Now where remission of this is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. We have a new covenant with Christ. It's the same as the old, but it's been fulfilled in Christ. And I now look to Jesus. I don't have to look at lambs and goats. I look at Jesus. So the temple, really, has been done away with and should remain done away with. Time for a new temple? They say so. I don't think so. For Christ is not entered into the holies made with hands, which are a figure of the true, but into heaven itself. Why build an earthly one if there's a heavenly one? Yes or no? Doesn't make much sense. Alright, so let's have a look at this interesting service. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and he shall appear a second time without sin unto salvation. Wherefore he is able to save to the uttermost those that come unto him. Everything the high priest wore, all the clothing stood for Christ, the inner garment, the white one, the righteousness of Christ, the outer one, then the ephod, all these symbols, the colors, tying him to the door and the gate and the veil. Every single stone, the twelve stones, the twelve tribes of Israel, everything refers to the tabernacle, even the roof 
of the tabernacle. Outside was an outer covering, which was made of badger skins, representing Christ's humanity, and then you have the colors that are associated with the door. So the badger skin, Christ veiled his divinity with humanity, Christ the Savior, skins of rams dyed red, Christ the sacrifice, covering of woven goat's hair, the righteousness of Christ, and the inner royal covering, blue, scarlet, purple, Christ the worthy King, Christ the exalted Savior. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Wow! Now, there were seven annual Jewish feasts also associated with this service. This was all written in the Law of Moses. There was a type and there was an anti-type. There was the Passover which was the sacrifice of the Lamb. It represented the crucifixion. Notice that it was on Nisan 14. Then there was the Feast of Unleavened Bread the very next day, Nisan 15. That's Christ, the body of Christ, Christ in the grave. And then you had the Feast of First Fruits, which is Nisan 16. So 14, 15, 16, the three days, the Friday, the Saturday, Sunday of the crucifixion. It's the resurrection. So even in their annual feasts, they were celebrating the work of Christ. Does that astound you? Wow! And then you had the Feast of Weeks, which was Sivan 6. That was 50 days thereafter. That was Pentecost. It celebrated the giving of the law, the tools of righteousness, how to be right in terms of your obedience. Grace comes from God. So now they were fully equipped. At the same time, they were sent out to preach Christ. The solution to the sin problem. The law defines the sin problem. Christ is the solution to the sin problem. So the cost of redemption. So, five trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, Tishri, was the heralding of judgment. An Advent movement, the Day of Atonement, the pre-Advent judgment, Tishri 10, and then the Feast of Tabernacles going home. Now let's have a look at one of these, the Day of Atonement. The harvest of redemption would come thereafter. So, the annual cleansing of the earthly sanctuary. This is great stuff. The Day of Judgment. That's what it stood for. So they blew the trumpets, do -do 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 and they brought two goats. And the one was called the Lord's goat, and the other one was Azazel. It was the scapegoat. But Azazel means the evil one, Lucifer. So they cast lots. And the scapegoat was led into the desert and was not sacrificed. He did not die. He was just led away. But the Lord's goat was sacrificed. So the blowing of the trumpet is a symbol of judgment, Revelation 14, 6, 7, Joel 2, 1. And the Lord's goat was sacrificed and the priest entered with this blood into the Most Holy. Remember the bells and the rope tied to his feet? And Hebrew says, into the second chamber, that's the Most Holy, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, Leviticus 16, 19. He shall sprinkle the blood seven times and cleanse it. So this cleansed the sanctuary and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Remember all the recorded sins were there. And all of these had to now be cleansed from the sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the holy place, that's the first tabernacle, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins, and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So the whole thing was to be cleansed from the record of sin. Unbelievable. So the high priest took in the ceremony all the sins that had been confessed for that entire year upon himself and he came out and he placed his hands on the scapegoat and he pushed his hands on it and transferred the record of sin. Who made you sin? Who made you sin? Satan made you sin. So if Satan made you sin, this record is transferred onto the scapegoat, Azazel, which stands for Lucifer, 
and he will one day pay the price for the forgiven sins. If you have not confessed your sins, who pays for those? You do. Wow. Now, he doesn't become the sin bearer because the Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. He's led into the desert. For on that day shall the priest make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Leviticus 16.30 So, in the day of judgment you will stand before God with how many sins on you? None. Isn't that astounding? That is phenomenal. Jesus' cleansing is total. You stand before God as though you have never sinned. Redemption is complete. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If we confess our sins, it's very important, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All of it. 1 John 1 verse 9. There are preachers who preach the opposite of this. Who say there is no greater damage that can be done than to preach of the lost sinful condition of man. We have to acknowledge and confess our sins if we want to be part of salvation. So it was a time of final confession, a time of cleansing, a time of judgment, and those who did not partake were cut off from the people. That's the sanctuary message. Cleansing of the sanctuary, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel 8, 14. There will come a time when Christ will enter the second chamber and will start cleansing the sanctuary and we'll deal with this 2,300 year prophecy at another stage. Unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So this judgment will take place, the Bible says. I beheld till thrones were cast down, the Ancient of Days did sit, the judgment was set, and the books were opened. And behold, one like the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. He has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Acts 17 verse 31. We better take note of judgment. It's coming. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must who all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. So, where would you like your sins to be? On your head or recorded in the sanctuary? Hey, get them recorded. The Lord will judge His people. There's the list. And if that list is as long as you can imagine, then goody for you. But if that list is one too short, you could be in trouble. So examine yourselves whether you be in the Lord. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. Revelation 22, 12. The coming of the Lord will reveal these things. I believe that we have nothing to fear. That 2,300 days has a specific time. It starts 457. If you add 2,300, it comes to 1844. It's an interesting time. It's a very interesting time. It's the time when the Communist Manifesto was written. It was a time when the evolution theory went out into the world, precisely 1844. It was a time when there was a big clash between the Messiah and the non-Messiah. The music of the world was written about the creation. Wonderful time. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. What is the standard of judgment going to be? Let's ask the Bible. So speak and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. The law is going to be the standard of judgment. James 2 verse 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. 
every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Do we hear much preaching about this in the world today? No. Oh no, oh no. If you love me, says Jesus, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. John 3, 21, 22. It's as plain and as simple as that. Ask forgiveness, God will place you under grace and your record of sin will be recorded in the sanctuary. Go and sin no more. Eat the bread of life. Drink in the water, the living water. Take the light of the world. Live, eat and drink your religion. There's no good having a halfway religion. And then when Christ returns, you will be cleansed of all your unrighteousness. All of it, none of it will be upon your head. Not one stain. And the righteousness of Christ will cover you again. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. This is a gospel we never hear anymore. But this is the truth, ladies and gentlemen. This is the truth. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. But believing, faith without works, without doing, is useless. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22, 11. Very shortly that decree will go out and probation will end. And if you're on the filthy side, it's too late. You remain filthy. If you're on the righteous side, you remain righteous. And very soon, the Lord will come. The Lord is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. I sometimes wonder when I look at the world, Lord, why haven't you come yet? <laughs> Some people say the Lord will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he doesn't come quickly. Because things are bad. But I know the character of my God. And he is long-suffering. And here is the patience of the saints, they that keep the commandments and the faith in Jesus. Jesus is coming soon, folks. He's coming soon with the clouds of heaven. And it's my prayer that every single one of us will have a right understanding what it means to serve Him. It doesn't just mean to serve Him and sing hallelujahs. It means accepting Him as my personal Savior and my King. And a King is one who is to be obeyed. Not because he wants to lord it over me. No, the Lord Jesus demonstrated that. He came to wash feet, didn't he? Yes. He didn't come to lord it over us, but because it is good for us. Because it is right for us. He says, I will write my laws into their hearts. That will be the new covenant. And when the law is in the heart, you will want to do what is right. You will want to do what is right. I'll tell you, your relationships will improve your love for each other will improve. Your whole mindset will improve if we come back into obedience and an obedience relationship with God. And there's nothing to fear of the judgment if you have confessed your sins. Nothing. And the longer the list of sins, as I've said, that is recorded in, in the heavens, the better. Because it means they're all there. And forsake them and give them up. That's my prayer for you. Tomorrow, we start looking at the other side of the coin. I have now done what I possibly can to show you what the biblical criteria for salvation and a relationship with Christ, what they entail. Tomorrow we will look at the counterfeit. We will identify the Antichrist by name. And I know that some might get hurt, but if you are angry with me, be angry with me, but not with the word. You can throw a tomato at me, but come back and eat more of the Word. And let's see if we can get through this together. Thank you for coming.